give the second talk. Uh, so it's going to be a different topic uh, <laughs> than just now, which was uh, Haskell. This will be a talk about compilers. Uh, and this is um, sort of early days of compilers. This is 1965. And the work was done, I think, 1962, early 60s. Uh, and this is the, the paper. Uh, they have very nicely um, done up HTML version of the original paper, which is which you can also find the PDF, but the HTML is actually much e uh, the website is actually much easier to read. Uh, so the, the the paper is about this um, DSL essentially a spe domain specific language for writing compilers, because I think the, the the historic context was at the time they were inventing many languages like Algol was one of the languages uh, from the early 50s and the, it was being implemented in the in the 60s, and they're writing compilers for all kinds of weird machines. So. On, Back then, they had many, many different types of machines with different assembly, assembly instructions. So writing compiler was a, taking up a lot of time. And one of the things people do was to see, can we have a, a more you know, productive way of writing compilers? Um, so just to explain, a compiler essentially is a, we use it all the time, but it, it somehow seems a bit like a black box to many of us. But it's really just a, a program that takes in uh, a program written in a source language and outputs a program in a, a, a target language. Um, the target language could be, say, you know, now we've heard of JavaScript compilers, right? It compiles to JavaScript. So, for example, it could compile from uh, Elm to JavaScript. So that's a compiler. Uh, in this case, they're, they're compiling from Algol to uh, machine code uh, at, that, at that time. Okay, so uh, this paper introduced the concept of uh, what's called a meta compiler. Uh, so, meta compiler is also a compiler, but uh, it takes in uh, a special DSL for writing compilers and outputs compilers. So, it's, uh, so again, just to recap, a compiler takes a source program, outputs a target program. A meta compiler outputs only a specific kind of target program, which is compilers. It doesn't output anything else. So uh, it helps compiler writers, essentially. Or well, some people call it a compiler compiler, because it's a compiler that produces a compiler. OK? All right. Cool. So let's look at what this DSL uh, looks like. So I'll just go with examples, because that's the easiest way. So uh, for, let me just show you how, how it works, for example. Let me give you an example of a compiler first, just to you know, set the stage. So let's say we have a, so this is like the hello world of uh, compilers. <laughs> so let's say we have an expression uh, written in this uh, infix notation. And we want to produce a, uh, Oh, okay. So I need to say make. We want to produce uh, an expression in a uh, sort of um, this stack notation. Assume you're programming for some kind of a stack machine, and these are like the instruction codes, right? So you would do ha you have push, which puts the uh, operands on the stack. And then each of the operators uh, pop the operands it needs and push the result back onto the stack. So, uh, so this is a translation of the input, which is the infix expression into this uh, sequence of uh, stack operations. Is that OK? All right, so this, is a, so this is an example of a compiler, right? So this compiler takes in expressions in infix notation and outputs this, uh, this, uh, stack, uh, this, this machine instructions for a stack machine. OK, so how do we, what does this look like now? So let me show you the compiler. Uh, let's clear the screen because, oh, it's a very small compiler, actually. but. Uh, so the compiler is written in something called the meta language, because this is a language that describes the, our input language, and, and also describes the output language, essentially. Uh, so let me run through the lines. So uh, we just sort of have two lines at the beginning and the end, just to indicate the start and the end of the program. So like dot syntax, this is the notation popular in those days, the 60s. If you use TROF, you know about dot something. But never mind. So uh, dot syntax, so this is the name of the uh, type of input language. It's called the expression language, expr. And then at the end, and in between is a number of rules. And this is meant to look like the uh, Becker's now form, actually. So th this is what, uh, in fact, this was, uh, Algo 60 was the first language, I think, formally specified in uh, BNF. Uh, before that, it was not formally specified. I don't know how they defined the language. But anyway, so this is a, uh, uh, in Becker's null form. So this is, you have a sequence of rules. Each rule is terminated by a semicolon. You can see that. So here we have um, four rules, right? Because you see four equal signs 
that's kind of the trick. Okay, and then the rules have a left hand side and a right hand side. So the left hand side is the the, the thing we're defining, and the right hand side is the the definition of the thing. Right. And then rules. Uh, so rules are okay. They are expressions with um, different kinds of symbols. But in, in, in particular, they have this the vertical symbol, the vertical vertical bar. So the vertical bar represents alternatives. So it's it's like A or B. So that's of the lowest uh, priority. Okay. So let's let's look at the let's look, look look at the bottom. I think it's easier to go from the bottom up. So the last rule is called the um, number rule. So the number rule matches and is defined as. So there's a some special construct. So the dot something is some like keywords in the DSL. So one of the keywords is dot number. So dot number is a special um, expression that matches any number. So this dot number will match like a uh, you know five for example. Okay, and then okay ignore the stuff in the uh, uh, the curly brackets first. Uh, and then, um, then we can define expression three as a as a number, and then expression two is defined for the multiplication and division because they bind uh, tighter, right? So expression two is defined as expression three, and then the asterisk is the um, the regular uh, in like in regular expression the zero or more of the the stuff after it, right? So expression two is. Um, expression three followed by zero or more, um, the asterisk followed by another expression three, or a divide followed by an expression three. But it could be many of copies of these, right? And then ex the original definition expert is just the, the same as expert two, except is 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 for the plus and minus. And it's at the top level because plus and minus binds the weaker than plus uh, multiply and divide. Okay. Right. Okay. Now talk about the stuff in the uh, curly braces that indicates what to output, because the job of the compiler is to output the uh, target language, right? So the the so far the syntax is to ex is to uh, express the language of the input. So now we look at the parentheses. So look again from the bottom. The the number says push, and then the dollar sign. So dollar sign is also a special symbol in the language. It outputs the token that was just matched by the uh, the dot number um, built in. So you output push followed by a space followed by the the number. Let's say push five, for example, right? Uh, and then we don't see that in expert three. Well, expert three is to handle, uh, of course, the parentheses because parentheses binds the tightest. So it's uh, at the expert three level. And then the only other parts is the times and divide. So uh, and they're quite simple actually, so they just output the operator because all the operands have already been pushed onto the stack. So they just output the operator name. So again, just look at the example. Uh, arithmetic in looks like this, and the output looks like this. So, oh, okay, in fact, this is quite nice. So on the same screen, we have all the, the components, right? So this is the the definition of the compiler. This is the input to the compiler, and if you run it through this, you get back uh, this output. Well, <coughs> yes. We're not going to be satisfied until you show us the meta file which defines the compiler. Of course, of course. Yes, yes. That's coming. That's coming. <laughs> <laughs> but that one is a little bit messy, so I have, to, I have to go through a few examples first to understand the the DSL. Yeah. So, so yes, we, we will eventually show you the. Uh, the, com the, the description of the compiler, actually, which is why this is called the meta2 compiler, right? Because it's two levels of meta. Anyway, uh, OK, but let, let, let's go step by step. OK, so this is the first part. So this is important to understand the first part, what, what the DSL looks like, right? And then what, what does it do? So let's look at a more complicated example now. So second example. Uh, second example is called AX. So AX. Uh, is a language with assignments, I guess. That's why it's called AX. And uh, it's a language with, with uh, just just assignments. It's, it doesn't do anything actually. So, but it's a language with just assignments. Uh, and you have also other operators like the unary minus and the exponentiation and so on. So it's sort of a step up from uh, the previous language, which was just a single line. This is multiple lines, in fact, right? And we will also compile this. Let's see what it compiles to. Uh, also to some kind of a 
stack machine, I think. Uh, oh, okay. So it compiles to also a kind of stack machine, but now we also have the ability to uh, um, add and store, uh, uh, so have a reference, like almost like the earlier talk talked about variable references. So in this case, we have like a memory address, you know, and we can store numbers there, and we can load the uh, values back from that memory uh, address. So and this is what it looks like if you compile it to the, uh, uh, the this particular machine, this stack machine enhanced with this uh, address and uh, load, and I think it replaces the the, the push with a literal. Uh, but sort of the concept is the same. Okay, so now we know this. Let's look at the uh, compiler. Um, how we would describe this compiler in this DSL. AXP meta. Ah, okay. So uh, it's written in a similar fashion. Uh, okay, so except maybe you can see it like EX5, it has the... So you introduce some new... Uh, uh, Syntax, right? I guess it's that's a dot ID, which is also a, a built into the language. It it is a uh, uh, it, it is it matches any kind of identifier. Think of it like your like identifier for like a C variable. So like the fern and the uh, whatever it was just now was the identifiers, right? So as you can see, uh, and we, and we, we can explain the whole thing now. So when you see an identifier, you would you would want to load. Means means you see it in the right hand side, right? You want to load its value. So that's why it, it transforms into load the name of the identifier. A number is the same, except it's now called literal. And then parentheses is the same. Uh, most of the rest are actually the same. Okay, except at the top, you have the, um, the AS, the assignment statement, I think. So this is where we use the identifier on the left-hand side, right? Fern, you know, colon equals is like Pascal uh, something. So you can see how it translates that. It, uh, you know, so first it issues the address to say that we're going to have an, uh, this is the identifier and here's the address. And then uh, it, it uh, pr processes the EX1 and then after that outputs the store instruction. So the result of uh, the body of the uh, assignment is stored into that address because the address is on the stack, right? So after EX1 is done, the stack is empty, then, uh, well, the stack has the, well, it's like a stack has the value of ex1, right? Whatever that expression is. So store will take the, the value of ex1 on the stack and the address of the identifier and sort of stick it in the memory, right? That's what store does. So, okay. So this is the second example. So actually the paper goes into more complicated examples, but I will skip the more complicated example because they compile to some uh, fairly strange machine code. At the time, uh, it, it was a uh, different machine code anyway. Yes, question. Can, can you show the the output of meta two for well, either this or the previous output. example? Yeah, I thought we saw it already. That's the lower, right? This one. Well, oh, the output. You mean the yeah. com the, oh, right. You, you mean the compiler? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. So uh, in this case, the, this particular uh, compiler generates the compiler in terms of Lua, but you could use C plus plus or whatever. Just Lua happened to be kind of simple. Uh, I'm not sure it would make much sense. We can look at it, I guess. Like sure, sure. No problem. We can look at it. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's kind of a lot of repeat, repeat, repeat. I mean, the reason is because uh, we need some way to do uh, localized blocks. And in Lua, repeat is apparently the way to do it. So this gives you a local scope. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the open and close parentheses in C. But in Lua, it's repeat and until. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, lots of repeat and okay you can see things like test string and so on which checks whether you match the literal strings and so on uh, and then we define functions of course um, unfortunately there's no so indentation it's yeah it's a recursive parser. descent parser yeah so, so if, you, if you're into the parsing uh, literature this actually generates a recursive descent parser uh, so what that means is uh, let's look at the definition again so what that means is whenever we encounter a, a, a a rule, we would sort of a rule is translated as a function, basically, right? So a rule, each rule it becomes one function, and whenever we encounter the rule, we would call that function to, you know, recursively uh, consume the input stream, right? And then th that that rule will return to us, and then we can consume some more, and then we can call other rules, 
So that's called the uh, recursive descent parsing. Okay. Okay. So now we come to the uh, to the force of the <laughs> the talk, which is uh, we are going to look at how to write the meta compiler itself, right? So so far I've been using the meta compiler actually. If you saw when I make uh, no, I haven't been using it. So if I try to produce the compiler, uh, xp dot lua, uh, it's up to date, of course. Uh, we'll just redo the whole thing. So okay. Uh, sorry, it's too low. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the, the meta compiler is called meta.lua. So this is the program that translates the, the, the DSL into this Lua, the Lua code that we saw, which is kind of horrendous looking. It, it wasn't meant for human consumption. OK. So the interesting, really interesting bit about this paper, really, is that uh, we can express this compiler, meta.lua, in that DSL. And now we're going to look at it. OK, but let me give you a caveat first. So, the point of the paper really isn't to produce a sort of um, production-ready DSL for writing compilers. It was really to give you a sort of a simplest example that would have this property that we can express the compiler in its own DSL. So this is called, called bootstrapping, if you've not heard of that. Uh, and we'll see why this is useful. But the point is just to get something simple that bootstraps so that you can enhance it later on. Okay, let's look at what that looks like now. So this would be the the main part of the, the paper, kind of. OK. Um, so let's look at, oh, no, we, I didn't put it in examples, because let's look at meta.meta. .meta. OK, this is a little bit longer, anyway. But uh, so with same thing, the syntax and so on. Uh, let's start from the bottom again. So uh, OK, so the top level now is a program, right? Because this is the, OK, so now we're going to think one level meta. So this is the meta compiler. So the input to this compiler is the, the things in, with, the, with the, the, the DSL, right? The input to this is the DSL, right? Previously, we saw the input was expressions. The input was assignments. Now the input is the DSL itself, OK? All right. So, <laughs> so the input is a DSL, and we, we call that the program. That represents the entire input. And again, remember the DSL has a, so this is a, it starts off with the literal dot syntax, which we know. And then it ends with the literal dot n. Right? And then literal dot syntax is followed by the ID, which is kind of like the name of the, the, the language in this case. Right? And then it, it has some, well, OK, this is like some header code I need in Lua just to require some. We, we have a small runtime. I can show the library, actually. It's also very small. It's like uh, 30 lines of Lua. So we have a little runtime library to do some things for us. And then, uh, so the bulk of the program really is a sequence of one or more rules. And that's what the uh, star rule means. So it's a syntax followed by identifier, followed by one or more rules, followed by the end. Uh, oh, OK, and, and at the end, what we do is quite interesting. At the end, what we do is we invoke the function program. Because this rule itself is transformed into a function, right? So at the very end of our Lua script, we need to have something that starts off the whole process, like the main, right? Because we, all we've done is define functions. We actually got to start consuming the uh, input. So we, here we actually call. So this will, this will convert into, like in this case, program um, open close um, parentheses, which, which calls the program itself, right? Uh, OK. So OK, let's see what's a rule. A rule is uh, some name, which is the name of the rule. In this case, the name of the rule is rule. Uh, <laughs> This is very strange. OK, so, the name, the, so this, this, this block of code, just to say, we create a function with that name. So function rule, bracket, bracket. This creates the, the, the function, like a define a new function. And then the, the rule has an equal sign, which is the literal equal sign. Uh, and then followed by something we call a choice. Again, choice, I guess it means because we have multiple alternatives, right? A or B or C. So we call it a choice. OK, fine. And then followed by the end of the rule, which is the uh, semicolon, which uh, outputs n. Uh, and the function and the n together forms a block of, uh, defines the body of the function. So the beginning function is function, some name, bracket. And then the end of the function is the word n. Okay? So this is Lua code, actually. But you don't have to really know. Lua code is like Python or Ruby. It's a dynamically typed language. OK, we're, we're almost done. So, yeah. What host language did the original paper use? It wasn't Lua, it was uh, 65. Machine code, machine code. Sort of like a assembly code, opcodes. Mm. 
Yeah, which looks a little bit more horrible. So I, that's why I choose to use this example, actually. Yeah, so the original paper doesn't use Lua, of course, because Lua didn't exist in 1965. But uh, for the convenience of modern day sensibilities, we will use Lua. <laughs> okay. So I don't have to explain to you all the, what all the funny opcodes mean, uh, because it's like three letter codes and stuff. Okay. So, uh, so, okay, so now we know choice. So choice, so choice again, remember, is to do with the, the, the vertical lines, right? A or B or C. So, okay, so we need this repeat until true business is just to create a, a block of uh, context so that we have, we have the ability to define local variables and so on. So that's what the whole repeat until true business really is. It's not really, we're not really doing any loops. So it's just a syntactical construct in Lua that lets us create a, a, a context. It's like your open, close, curly brackets in C. Okay? All right. So a choice uh, we define as a, uh, so the things between the uh, vertical bars, we call them sequences because they are actually a sequence of things, right? Like uh, syntax followed by equal followed by blah, 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 right? It's actually a sequence of uh, things. So it's a sequence um, followed by one or more uh, vertical bars and more sequences. So sequence, vertical bar, sequence, vertical bar, sequence means first sequence or second sequence or third sequence and so on and so forth. Uh, she what happens? Okay, and then the, so the choice, okay, so here's an interesting decision here. So the way, we, the way we do choice is once we find the one of the choices that works, uh, we will just decide that's the one. We, we don't go on and try the others. So it's not really Becker's now form in that sense. It's almost like today what we would call, uh, well, not quite also, though there's something called passing expression grammars, which also have a very similar effect where it, it sort of sticks to the first uh, sequence that, that, that worked. It doesn't go and try the others. It's, like greedy. it's something like a greedy, yeah. So this, the, the reason for this is to avoid sort of backtracking. We just sort of go down the tree. We don't, we don't go different branches. That's why we have this. Uh, so switch is just some kind of global variable that tells us if something worked or not. Something was matched or not, right? So we use switch everywhere, actually. Okay, so this is just to say, when we match something, okay, we're done. We don't have to check all the other choices anymore. So we keep trying until we find the first one that worked, right? So this is what this does, basically. All right, uh, now we get to the, still the easy things. Okay, now let's get to the sequence. The sequence, as I say, is, a, is, a, is literally a sequence of uh, expressions, right? So each of these expressions is called a primary. Uh, and it's it defined similarly to choice, except, of course, the, the, it's, it's just separated by spaces. You know, like, like, like this, right? Like, I, uh, like what's the example? Like, like this, syntax followed by ID followed by, right? That's a, that's a sequence. In fact, this is one sequence. There's no choice here, actually. Right? This is syntax followed by ID followed by asterisk rule followed by N. Uh, and we'll handle the asterisk uh, on top. Okay, and the real true kind of the heart of the program really is the primary, which is where most of the constructions, most, most of the constructs are handled. So, uh, we're done. We only have two more. So, uh, just, just sort of bear with me. Uh, okay, so a primary is the thing that the sequence is made out of. A sequence is made of multiple primary expressions. Okay? And primary can be uh, many things. Uh, let's just go top down. A primary can be uh, an ID, right? So primary is the right-hand side. Remember, we're on the right-hand side now right? because the rule is handled at the earlier on. This is the right-hand side, right? So primary is in the right-hand side. The ID means like we see an uh, uh, expert or something like that, right? Or EX1 in the right-hand side. Means, as we say, we will call the function because it's recursive descent, right? So when we see the name of a rule, this, the ID means it's the name of a rule, basically, right? We see the name of a rule, we will call the function. This is how we call a function. We, we stick the name down there and we put it with the parentheses. So we call the function. Uh, next thing, it could be, it could be a, a literal string, like the dot syntax, right? It could be a dot, like a dot syntax, a literal, so in, in the single quotes. That, that is what the dot string is, the stuff in the single quotes, right? And, and in that case, we run a little helper function which tests whether the next input sequence is indeed that particular string, like the word dot, like the string dot syntax. So when we see a, a string, we test it, is that the string in the input? Right, that's sort of natural, I guess. Okay, and here, is get, it, here it gets a bit uh, weird because now we're going to talk about ID and string again. But the <laughs> now the, the thing about the third rule is, uh, is the, li the literal dot ID. 
right? So it's, it, it only matches this three characters, dot and i and d, whereas the first rule matches any valid identifier. At first I was very confused, why does this id appear so many times? But anyway, yeah, so th that's the thing. So the, 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 here is the literal string id, and um, so how do we match the identifier? We sort of just turn to the uh, regular expression. So identifier is a al uh, alphabet followed by um, uh, one or more alphabets or numbers. Uh, that's the definition we, we use here, right? Like, like uh, A15 is an identifier, right? Uh, and we just stick it into this input because later we might be asked to produce it in the dollar sign, right? So we've got to save it somewhere so that we can produce it later on when, when we, we're asked for it. Uh, number and string goes the same way, so I wouldn't explain. Um, we have uh, something called empty, which matches nothing, so that always just sets the switch to true. Uh, so that's simple. And then we could have, uh, oh, here's where things get messy. So we, in a primary expression could itself be ch a choice. So that's just handled this way, very nice. And of course, the key thing is here, we, how, is how, how we handle the, um, the clean star operator, right? So the last part is to do the clean star, which is, uh, and here we actually do a loop, actually, right? Because we need to match m multiple, one, zero or more copies of this particular primary. The matching of the primary happens inside the primary, and then this part is just to do the, the loop to keep matching them until no more, and then we, we exit because we only go as far as... Uh, we don't know how many copies there are, so we just keep matching until we're out of it. All right, and the last bit I think is quite straightforward. So output is the bits in the curly brackets. So that's the bit that's supposed to produce the... Uh, output to the, in fact, it just produces, it just, it just writes to send output actually, right? Like you saw the word literal, we just print the word literal on the send output, or the word push, or whatever it is. So, um, how it works is it's basically the curly brackets, and in, in between the curly brackets could be either strings or dollar signs, right? So that's why it's written like this. So it's a zero or more strings or dollar signs. It's quite, quite a nifty way to write it, actually, right? So the, the, it's a star bracket, dollar sign or string, which exactly is what I just said, but in this DSL. So the, so the, the three cases are, uh, it is the dollar sign, right? Means uh, it, we're asked for something we just read, and we always assign it to this local variable called input. So we just write the variable input, which, which prints it, basically, right? Uh, it is a string. So we, we just print whatever that was because uh, you know if it's the, the you know like the string, uh, like uh, like push right, then we just print the word push, right. And uh, finally, we, if it's the uh, we, so all the things in in one parenthesis uh, goes uh, after the stuff you printed, we just print a new line just to have things on separate lines and you can read it. All right. That was uh, that was the meta compiler. So what do I mean by this is the meta compiler? Maybe let me just uh, illustrate this. Uh, so we can use the compiler to produce a file, right? So oh, no, we can let me clear and then go to the top. So we can take this input meta dot meta, which is what we just saw the not too many lines, hopefully, and then we run it through the compiler, which is meta. Meta.lua, right? Then we store it somewhere else. We call it uh, meta2.lua, just not to bash our original file, right? So, uh, turns out that, of course, this is also what we call a fixed point, in that uh, the process of running meta, the DSL, through the meta compiler produces the same source code as the meta compiler. So the meta.lua and meta2.lua uh, are exactly the same, which is what we would expect. I think Kang Ma actually did a talk on the, so the safe, safety in compilers, yes, right? So there's, there's, some, there's some familiarity there. Because we're, we're essentially doing this idea of uh, moving the compilers forward through uh, compiling the previous version on the, you know, the next version from the previous version, right? But it didn't start like that. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Where did the first meta run? That's a good question, right? So this is like a circular definition, right? Uh, so that, that's why this thing is so amazing, right? So actually, 
all the code is just in what you saw, right? We can ignore the meta compiler code itself, which I can show you. It just looks like a lot of code. It's actually how many codes? How many lines of code is there? I, mean, I never tested actually. Meta do not is like uh, well, it's okay. Two hundred fourteen. Well, it's kind of repeat. It's kind of repetitive code. Repeat, repeat until and you know so on, so on, so on. Uh, whereas we will always work on the level of the DSL, right? Which is only you know thirty three lines of DSL. Oh, okay, so I forgot to tell you how big is the runtime, in case you think I was cheating and everything was in the runtime, right? Because <laughs> there's a runtime, right? How, how big is the bootstrapping compiler? So the runtime, oh, let me show you the runtime first. The runtime is, okay, slightly bigger, 48 lines of Lua code. Let me show you the runtime, just quickly show you. There's no magic, really. The runtime is to do like uh, input, you know, read all the stuff, uh, some ways to move around this, the input. Uh, we, uh, also, we handle white space implicitly. La. Notice we never code anything about white space. We just sort of skip all the white space. Uh, the real deal is the read function, really. The read function just uh, skips all the white space and reads the deck token. That's basically it. And, and checks the token against this, this thing called the finder. And the finder can actually either match a regular expression. Sorry. Uh, ma uh, this thing, match, is to do regular expression. String.match, blah, blah, blah. And then this test prefix is to do the matching the literal string. So basically, you can see it here, right? Um, yeah, unfortunately, we have to do strings separately. We can't do it inside. OK, but uh, that's all. That's all. I and mean, this is just to ex export the, export the um, this is like JavaScript kind of. We return a module object back to the, uh, the thing that required the runtime. So we, we only need uh, three functions. Uh, well, it's an exercise to the reader to get rid of the two. We just need, if we can only do one, this would be better. Uh, but uh, so far we need three, but uh, just like this. Okay. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Oh, how how do we get? Sorry, how do we get to the first one? Yes. Ah, uh, the first one you got to write it by hand, basically. There's no escaping, I guess, because you got to start somewhere. So the first one, but you can write in anything actually. You don't have to write it in Lua actually. You don't have to write it in Lua. You can write it in whatever language you're, you're most familiar with. You can write it in Python or C, or you could get it from somebody else, as long as it interprets the same DSL. Can you copy it from the paper? In theory? <laughs> Kind of, yes. Unfortunately, the paper doesn't output something you can run directly. It outputs sort of machine code. You also got to write an emulator for that machine, yeah. which you can do because uh, there are some people who did it this way. Actually, you can also find it online. Some people actually did it the way the paper did, which was output the machine code and then run the machine code on an emulator for the machine, which, which is doable, which works, which works. I mean, it's just a little bit tedious. What machine is it? It's actually his own virtual machine. He, defi he devised a, a custom virtual machine to do this job, yeah. It's literally just enough power to write meta. Kind of, kind of, yeah. And so, so that each machine instruction is quite simple to implement by itself. And it's just literally one by one. There's no back and forth or whatever. It's just literally line by line machine instructions. OK, and. It's just a shame that meta.meta uses all the features of meta. Because if it used less, you could just hand write of course. the version which only implements those that use them, then you can find stuff and then, yeah. I think, I think that was the point of meta. It has to be the minimum possible, minimum yeah. viable medical. Yes, product, in like. a sense, yes. It, it is sort of the minimum viable. Like if there was any other option, then like. Yes, uh, question? What's the modern equivalent of this? Like, is there anything that's like this right now? Like, yes. Is everything for passing to the code that? Yes, yes, yes. I will cover that at the end. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so I want to tell you why bootstrapping is so important, right? Uh, so let's, let's, this is not in the paper, actually, so it's something I thought of, but it's not a very good example, but never mind, let's try. What we want to extend the DSL, right? That's really where the power of bootstrapping comes in. So let me try to show you how we can do that. Uh, so let's look at the meta compiler again. Okay, see, this is the sort of, I think this is also like, uh, another analogy to today is it could be, in a different world, is something like the, the Lisp interpreter written in Lisp. But that's, that's sort of trick lying because it doesn't implement the garbage collector and all the other stuff. But anyway, this is, this is like the real deal because this implements everything. Like what you see is really what is generated. There's, there's no trickery behind the scenes, literally. Because the list interpreter will reuse the reader of the host list, which is kind of like, you know. But anyway. In the same way you're using Lua, right? Lua has the garbage. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I use Lua, of course. But you know, we have to bottom out somewhere, right? I mean, th there's some bottom level which you, you implement things in. Uh, what am I saying? OK, yes. So we want to uh, extend the DSL. Because you might say, well, you only give me uh, three kind of, uh, four kinds of uh, sort of uh, uh, wildcard things, right? Can either be ID, number, 
actually only three lah, because empty is not really a thing. Empty is just nothing. So actually, number and empty seem to sorry. Be able to remove. Um, no, numbers is not. Numbers is a specific kind of string, right? So no, no, but I mean you could remove it because it's not used in methods of meta. So you didn't have numbers. I see. You, you are play. correct. I think. But I think it's for the purpose of the paper, um, he implements a subset of Algol 60 with this compiler. So I think Algol 60 would need to have some kind of numbers. <laughs> yeah, that could, that could be why he, he has numbers here. Uh, okay, but the, uh, let me back to my, my, my story was, I, I only give you sort of three kinds of uh, wildcard. So uh, like, what if I want a floating point number? How would you write that, right? You, you, you can't, well, you could, actually you could write it, right? How would you write it? You could say it's a number, followed by an optional dot and some, other, some more numbers, right? Okay, I mean, you can sort of wing it, but you can imagine there are some things you can't really express in this, uh, if I only give you four primitives, or well, okay, well, three actually, empty is not really a thing. So I only give you three primitives, number, ID, and string, right? Right? Okay, so, see, actually, you know, we use the power of regular expression in Lua. So can we expose that power to the DSL writer. So what if we could let the DSL writer use regular expression? In fact, this is now very common. Of course, Lexus very commonly lets you write a token matching as a regular expression. This, this doesn't. You can't. But well, let, let's you, try and make already, it. You're already doing it, right? You're Sorry? using the part of the DSL. No, you, but you, can't, you, but you the, can't write a particular language definition which uses regular expressions to Define the tokenizer. Oh, so you want you saying you want to implement you want regular expressions inside Meta itself? Yes, yes. So that the the DSL writers can use reg, a regular expression to define new kinds of tokens, not just the three that I have predefined. Yeah, like dot R E bracket. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. these are quite limited, right? Number ID and string is just sort of, you know, what what if you want other things, right? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you might you want. You might want an alternative definition of ID, for example. You, mean you don't like my definition, it's only alphabets. And you mean you want underscore, for example. Actually, I don't allow underscore here in, in IDs, which most languages do these days. They allow underscores in the identifiers, right? So maybe you disagree with my meaning of identifier. So how will we do that, right? Extend meta. Huh? You extend the meta. Yes, yes. But how will we do that exactly? So we have to, so we have to edit this file now. Uh, so we have to extend meta, yes, exactly. And how we do it, so this is the, the, the interesting thing. We don't edit any Lua code directly. Like we don't edit meta.lua. Well, we could, but that would be hard. So we, we try not to do that. Uh, so we will edit this file, actually. Does that mean? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, the dollar sign, yes. Something to do with the dollar sign, actually. Um, so how do we do it? <laughs> okay. I've done it before, but uh, it's been a while. So let's try. So let's put it uh, after the str after the string. It's okay because we will uh, we will we'll treat it differently from a string. So we will say uh, a regular expression starts with uh, a hash because I think Perl does that or something. I don't know. I mean, just just for convenience, I will say it starts with a hash, and then uh, followed by a string, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> because it's uh, anything, right? Anything goes. So it's a, it's, a, it's a hash followed by some string. Okay, so hash, then the small, the small quotes, and then regular expression inside, right? Okay, so what's the code, right? So, well, it's gonna look like the rest of the lines below, right? Because it's gotta save some of the input, right? So local underscore input equal underscore. So we call the uh, run, which is our runtime library, actually, parse, uh, the double quotes, single quotes, because we use double quotes in the Lua code. You know, just to, otherwise, we get confused between the, the quotes. So, you know, this the Lua code uses double quotes and not single quotes. Uh, I, I don't know if Lua, yeah, just dollar actually. Yes, that's right. Dollar, we finish the quotes, close the code, and single quote, and close this. Okay. Right? Should be, right? <laughs> Hopefully I got it correct. Da, 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 da. Looks correct to me, okay. <laughs> all right, so now that we have this, all right, so can we, how, do, how do we get, now how do we get the uh, new compiler? <laughs> this is not, this doesn't run, that's the thing. This is the description of the compiler, right? This is not a compiler. <laughs> huh? Yes, 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 exactly, right. That's, well, that's the only thing you could do, actually. 
we have not more things we can do. So we, we actually just did it just now. So we just do it again, uh, whatever, write it again. So meta dot meta, which is the new one, right? This has the regular expression stuff. And then we pass it through the old one, which is this guy, meta dot lua, which didn't have the regular expression stuff, which also means we can't use the regular expression in meta dot meta yet, because it, the old one doesn't know about regular expressions. But it knows about hash and strings and so on. And then we output this to, we call it meta with regular expressions. Let's do kind of not mess with the name. Uh, OK, so. But now we need to go back to meta.meta and replace. Yeah, that's the, the part I, I haven't thought about that. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah we should yeah. do. We can, we can. It's pretty straightforward because you already have the right. The oh, let's just check what, what, is, what is meta, what's the difference in the new code? Because that, that will be small, actually. Mm -hmm. And the new code and the old code. Because, uh, uh, because we only added one more rule, actually, which, which means there's, uh, we added one more alternative, actually, not one more rule. So there's uh, one more repeat and until block, I think. Uh, <coughs> this method of Lua. Oops. Oh. Sorry, this is a bit messy. Let's just look at that by itself. Ah, here we go. So, yeah, basically you can see what it does, right? It tests for the string, the hex, because we wanted to see the hex. And then it does some stuff, and then we check for the parse string. We stick it to the input, and then we write the code, which is to this code, input, and so on, uh, parse, write input. This is the, the code, right? And so on, and then repeat. Yes, so that works. Uh, what do we say? Oh, we wanted to replace the. Yeah, oh, this this is the thing I actually didn't try. So hmm. okay, let's see. Uh, so, no, I mean, not, not ID this but one. Like dot ID, yeah. you, should, you should be able to remove your. Logo. No, but dot ID is the literal ID. That's the literal yeah, dot ID. Huh? No, no, I can never replace this. No, the curly bra like inside the curly braces. Uh, no, no, no. no. In, in the real I can replace this actually, yeah. but. I would still have the other one, so uh, it, it would look more messy, right? Can it would be actually be longer. Dot number and then hash, uh, actually no, it would actually be longer. Mm. If I replace, I could replace this dot ID with the regular expression, yeah. but it's a, a more characters than the word dot ID. No, because, but then you can remove the... No, I can't, because I still need to provide dot ID to the writers of the DSL. I cannot change the DSL to not provide the dot ID, right? Oh, right. Then I'm sort of... All, all the programs would break if, if it is .id, right? So that's why I said this is not the perfect example, but uh, because of this reason, actually. But what we can do is we can write, uh, we can write, uh, can write, we can update the program earlier to handle floating point numbers, as I said. Then let's just see how that would look like. So let's actually use the construct because we have never actually used it before. We just defined it, right? So then let, let, let's use it now. So unfortunately, we'll go back to this example. Because, so basically we will not use dot number because this only matches like, like integers, right? So let's say we want to match the, the I think we got to write it as, no, no, no. What am I doing? D plus or something? Or like Percent A, a D, sorry, plus, right? Ah, sorry. Let me just look at look at how it's done in Meta. <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Meta. Meta. The meta. Uh, no number is oh D plus right D plus. D plus. I think we need a we need a quoted dot and. Oh, we need to put this in the. The this is. Oh, you see, you think it needs to be optional? Or? Yeah, well, you Percent D. This is D star, actually, right? Oh, right, well. Because, well. Be. Uh, star, maybe. Hmm. That's kind of ugly. No? What? Oh, multiple dots. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. You can do a dot question mark. What did I do? Oh, got question mark. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. No, you want mm. the whole thing to be like. No? You, you, you have some. It's actually kind of complicated. We need to say, when, when you have a dot, you must have. No, but. 
Yeah, you have some digits, mm -hmm. and then you optionally have a dot and Sorry. more digits. <laughs> Yeah, regular expressions is too hard, so let's not, let's not, <laughs> okay, but in theory, you can write it. <laughs> let's just not write it now, because, uh, yeah, just put it back just, exactly. Uh, the question mark outside of parents. Uh, what, what the question mark outside of parents? Yeah. Ah, right, right, okay, cool, cool, cool. Sorry. Yeah. I think late. Uh, okay, yes, uh. You can have a star, you must have a plus. Oh, yeah, I must have a plus. Because maybe you, I mean, yeah, it depends on whether you allow one dot. Uh, some languages allow one dot, sure. like Python. Can you, can you remove the dot number? <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I hope this works. Fingers crossed. Okay. <laughs> Actually, no. The white space don't matter. Uh, yada yada. Okay. So we make the examples arithmetic dot Lua. Oh. Hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Is is the old, the wrong compiler? Wrong compiler. So the old compiler says, "What is this uh, hash thing?" Crashes because. No idea what this hash business is. Uh, it's Lua, not, not uh, Lua, Lua. Lua. Uh, right, right. Sorry. Right, da, da, da. The new compiler, right? Hopefully that works. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. <laughs> that means it didn't blow up. Uh, so let's change the example to use that, right? Otherwise, we don't know whether it actually works or not. Uh, so whatever. Uh, put it somewhere inside just to make it hard. 3.5. Okay. <laughs> Moment. Okay, let's. Clear the screen. Moment of truth. Uh, examples. Arithmetic dot in. Lua. Examples. Arithmetic dot Lua. That. Oh, doesn't work. <laughs> the dot. Seems like I think we messed up about the dot. Uh, yeah, double backslash because you want to pass the backslash to the right again. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. That makes sense. Because now I'm passing a, a backslash dot, which doesn't mean anything, right? Mm -hmm. It's like C, right? Backslash N. Good point. Ah, uh, okay. What are you going to yeah, do again? Yeah, meta, that meta. Yes, 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 yes. I no problem. Oh, oh, right. I did this guy, right? Mm -hmm. And then we compile it again. <laughs> this guy. And we run it again. Hey. No! Oh, doesn't work. <laughs> well, okay, failed demo. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll debug it and figure it out. Uh, any case, uh, if you're interested in all this code and stuff, it is on uh, the URL is kind of small. I, I'll, I'll, sh I'll paste it into the uh, uh, the Meetup group Facebook. Uh, it's all uh, available online. Uh, maybe you can do the example with the. Uh, Regular expression, yeah. Yep, things happen. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, so I want to talk about the uh, stuff we can use today. Uh, this is 1965. It was a little bit old by now, but it's still quite amazing, right? I mean, it's old stuff, but it's um, pretty neat. Uh, we have method other languages. If you don't like Lua, if you like JavaScript, or if you like C. Uh, and today, um, the thing that is the closest to meta is old meta. You can see the uh, allusion to meta. <laughs> it's, uh, and it actually uses passing expression grammar, which I mentioned in passing, which allows for a limited form of um, backtracking. Whereas in meta, there is, there's no backtracking at all. Uh, and then uh, the guys who did OMeta actually went on to do something called OM, which is fairly similar, except OM separates the, the actions, I mean the, the, the semantic actions, which is the printing of the, in this case, was just printing of some strings into a separate thing from the parser. And they actually have a quite a complicated example where they write a compiler from ES5 to ES6 in ohm, basically in sort of ohmeta, which is pretty much like meta. But they have more predicates, I think they have, you know, you have the plus, we don't have the plus predicate if you, if you recall. So we only had the star. So you have other predicates uh, more commonly used like, um, like plus and uh, they even have things like negation and um, you can write custom um, expressions in the host language. We can write a Lua expression that if the Lua expression returns true, then we continue the rest of the parse. So that's actually very powerful. You can do things like symbol tables and things like that with, uh, with uh, predicates. Uh, that's the sort of the evolution of meta. All right, uh, that's, that's all I have. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? How do you come across this paper? How did I come across this paper? Oh, this, is, this, was, this was mentioned on the uh, ACM. 
that's the first place I come across it in uh, two years ago. Mm, it's been a while. Okay. So if you're interested, you can read up on. Uh, oh, oh, my internet is very slow, but th there's an ACM article in the ACM Q uh, publication on Meta, where this person was uh, okay. This person was trying to. Uh, it says 1960. I think the actual work was done in 62, but the paper came out in 64. Um, yeah. So he, he sort of went through the the, the meta compiler. And actually, the more interesting thing was the the Lua implementation, which was actually very interesting. So this one was still talking about the ma the virtual machine and all that stuff, which was a bit. Oh, I can show you the virtual machine stuff if you you want to see it. It's it's uh, just for completeness' sake, but it's really a little bit ugly. But uh, blah 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 blah. So let me just skip to the end. The meta compiler written in itself, right? This is the this is the meta compiler. Figure five is the meta compiler written in itself. It looks like this. So the out is kind of like our we, we just have default by out. Out is just print something. So we don't have the out. We just print. So the, so these are these things out like the gn1 and uh, tst and so on. So these are like opcodes to uh, sort of a virtual machine and the bt and so on. So uh, it's a little bit unreadable, I think. But, uh, this is the original meta in meta um, because it generates machine code. It's a little bit hard to read. Uh, what was I going to say? Ah, yes, there, there is the the Lou implementation was not written by me originally. I sort of stole it from Lou Valiant, uh, which is over here, just to give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, yeah, so I kind of it's mostly from here, except maybe the example of the regular expression. Which uh, which is the part that I did actually, uh, yeah. And he has some other things about. Uh, well, he has something called no meta for Haskell, since we have some Haskellers in the uh, uh, in the audience. You can check it out if you're into this kind of stuff. Right. Yep. That's that's it. Other questions? So I don't know. I really like this kind of uh, you know. Something that outputs itself. So if you see more of that, let me know. I think I'll be uh, pretty interested. <laughs> uh, okay. So right. Okay. So let's let, let's just close off the papers we left. I think so. Let's, so I'm also the.